Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to the seventh Sunday of Easter as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome all of you that are gathered here in the sanctuary and all of you that are worshiping at home. We're so glad that you have chosen to join us. I normally go through and take some time with all the things that are listed in our news and notes. I'm not going to do that because you guys are responsible adults. You can read through them. I'm just going to highlight some things I would like you to check out. Our weekday Bible studies, including the teen Bible study on Sunday, uh, Children's Church after the message this morning, uh, our request for Fellowship Hour sponsors, our Franklin Avenue Mission News, private home communion with myself or Pastor Hensler, who, by the way, welcome Pastor Hensler. We're always glad to have you here assisting. The Fill the Fab Baby Bottle Drive, uh, the Save the Date note for our upcoming church directory photos, and uh, if you're watching at home, news and notes can be accessed either on the Facebook page or on our website, so you can check all these things out there. And I want to just go through those really quickly because there's something else I want to talk to you about. You may have heard recently uh, a change in the Michigan State guidelines as far as COVID safety measures. This past Friday, Governor Gretchen Whitmer announced that the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has updated the gatherings and mask order to align with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's latest guidelines on face coverings. This order took effect yesterday. Thursday, the CDC released updated guidelines recommending fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks or physically distance in any setting except where required by federal, state, local, tribal, territorial laws, rules and regulations, including businesses and workplaces. Which means you don't have to wear them, but if you walk into Meyer and they tell you to wear a mask, you have to wear it. Under the updated Michigan Department of Health and Human Services gathering and mask order, Michiganders who are outside will no longer need to wear a mask regardless of vaccination status. Well, indoors, fully vaccinated Michiganders will no longer need to wear a mask, but residents who are not vaccinated or have not completed their vaccinations must continue to wear a mask or face covering to protect themselves and others. After July 1st, the broad indoor mask mandate will expire. What does this mean for us? Good Lutheran question, right? What does this mean? Well, for us here at Lamb of God, I think it means this. All along, no matter what the government says, because this is a house of worship and because we are engaged in worship, we were never required to wear a mask or social distance. We were exempt from those policies. We at Lamb of God chose to do that out of love for you so that people could attend here and not be scared and not be fearful, but could be safe and comfortable. My guess is right now, about 75 to 80% of those of you that attend here have received at least one vaccine, if not both. My recommendation is this. Beginning the first Sunday in June, June 6th, those of you who have been vaccinated and are here at worship no longer need to wear a mask, no longer need to socially distance. Those of you that have not been vaccinated, you're on the honor system, you should wear a mask. I will not be the mask police. I will not go around and check to see if you have a vaccine card. You're all Christians, I can trust you. I also think that starting June 6th, we can bring back something that we have not had for a while, and that is when we share the peace, we stand up. We walk over to our brother in Christ and we shake their hand. And if they stand up, we give them a hug. That's what I would like to do. Two weeks from now, we have a congregational meeting. I would like to hear what you think. I would like to hear your discussions, either before that time or at the meeting. I want you to still come here and be comfortable and feel safe. But I believe the time has come when we can join in 
with what the Department of Health and Human Services suggest. Even more so here because we gather in the presence of, by the name of, and by the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who rules over all things and protects us from all things, including the pandemic, who is the source of the vaccine and the reason why you and I are here today and not in the hospital. Now, pray on that if you would, please. That being said, my usual announcement to those of you that are worshiping at home, if you have prayer requests, uh, enter them on the side of the uh, Facebook, uh, where, the, where the live stream is, the Facebook commentary thing, and uh, they will come up to me and get to me for the morning prayers. One quick note also about our Lord's Supper celebration. We celebrate closed communion. We invite all who are LCMS members to come up and partake. If you're not an LCMS member, you're welcome to come. Put your hands across your chest like this, and I will give you a blessing based on your baptism, or you remain in your seat. It's not to say that your faith is any less than mine. We believe when you come up here and kneel at the rail, we are in communion, in communion with each other, in communion with our Lord and Savior, in communion with all of the main tenets that are listed in the small catechism. And if you are not an LCMS member, I just want to talk to you before you come up and make sure that that communion in faith is really there. All right, with that, we can still do it one more Sunday. And even after that, we could do it. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. Hallelujah. For now. For now, for this Sunday, remaining in your seats, raise your hand, wave to the person in front and back of you, wave to the camera, and let's look forward to that day when we can do more than wave and are very comfortable in doing so. We begin now our worship with our opening hymn, for which you may remain seated. Please stand if you're able. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you take a moment out for silence, reflecting on God's word and our sins. O oh, Almighty God, Merciful Father, 
I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, and by the grace of God, bring to you his words of forgiveness. And in the stead and by command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We responsibly read Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And its leaf does not wither. In all that it does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this Sunday comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, beginning at the 12th verse. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. 
All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons were in all about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language Akeldava, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry, an apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 5, beginning at the ninth verse. The first verses of this reading are the verses Pastor will use as our guide in our message today. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand if you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus is speaking. He's praying. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated with the children that are able. Come on forth for a message from Pastor. Good morning, girls. You've had babysitters, right? Do the babysitters seem to know when mom and dad aren't there, your schedule? Like when to do things and when not to do things? How do you think that is? Do they just like mystically have that knowledge implanted in their head? Or do mom and dad, through some kind of like ESP force, tell them it's time for them to go to bed? How do they know? Mom and dad tell them. They babysitted you before, but probably the first time mom and dad left them a list. Right, mom? Yes. <laughs> and on that list, it was pretty detailed. It might be this. At 6 p.m., call and order pizza from this place, and here's the money. They can watch TV from 6.30 to 8 p.m., and knowing you guys, it was in separate rooms. 8 p.m., shower and get ready for bed, taking turns one at a time and remaining in separate rooms. 9 p.m., you're in your room with a light off. Keep them in separate rooms because otherwise you will fight. You guys confessed that last Sunday. I remember. I listened. All three of us shared a room. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Have the police ever showed up? Why do your parents leave a list? Why do they tell the babysitter what to do? Is it to be mean to you? No, because I won't do it. And so, it, you're right. You won't do what you normally do unless they leave a list. So really, is that an act of meanness or an act of love? Love. To make sure that you guys are taken care of. It's best to stay on a schedule. And it's, she wants to make sure that everything happens that's supposed to happen when they're not there. That's what Jesus was doing in our gospel reading. In John 17, 11, he was telling his disciples that he would not be in the world much longer, but they are going to remain in the world. And he's talking to the Heavenly Father, saying, I'm coming back to you. So, Holy Father, keep these safe in your power by your name, the name that you have given me, so that they may be united as one. And that's an act of love too, isn't it? Jesus is going. Where's he going? Well, he's going to heaven, but first he's going to the cross. And what kind of an act is that? Love. And then he's going to the tomb. Is he going to stay there? He's going to rise again from the dead so that we might know we have eternal life, and that is an act of love. And after that, what happens? He stays here, he hangs around. For What happens at, after 40 days? He rises again. We, if we, a lot of churches celebrate it, it's called an ascension service. It would have been this last Thursday. Jesus ascending to heaven. Is that an act of love? But he's leaving us. But he didn't leave us alone, did he? He sent somebody that was better than a babysitter. Who was that? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't need a list from Jesus or a list from the Father. He knows. He knows exactly what you need so that you stay in faith, right? And that's what he does in your life. He keeps pointing you to Jesus. He points to the times when you disobey and break the rules. He moves you to ask forgiveness and points you to the place where that forgiveness is found, and that's in Jesus. 
And that is a very, very loving thing, isn't it? And that's the loving God that we have. Let's pray and thank him for all these loving things he's done for us. And you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for making sure we are taken care of. Our sins forgiven. Our faith kept strong. And our eyes pointed to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You can return back to your parents. And the next time that you have a babysitter, you're going to do every single thing they tell you to, right? You don't have a babysitter anymore? You had a babysitter on Saturday. Maybe you better check that out. <laughs> Maybe they paid them off. You go back and talk about that with mom. <laughs> and you guys last Sunday thought Olivia spilled the beans. <laughs> we continue on now uh, with our sermon hymn. Mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning comes from our epistle lesson. There actually should be a one in front of that, John. 1 John 5, verses 9 through 12, it's entitled, Only Two Options. I want to start off by talking about sitting on the fence. You know what I mean by sitting on the fence? Middle of the road. You've got one side here, one side there, and you try to remain right here in the middle. There are times when it's advisable to sit on the fence, to remain in the middle. I found that out, uh, I think it was last month, I was meeting with a couple friends of mine that I hadn't seen in a while. And we got talking about politics. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Big mistake. And uh, discussion came about uh, how the inner cities are struggling and they need help. And I happened to mention a politician who I thought was addressing that. And one of my friends said, yeah, but he's against abortion. How can you speak good about him? Well, we weren't talking about abortion, were we? And so he went off on me for a while about that. Then I happened to say, well, as far as abortion goes, I do stand against abortion. In fact, I voted for this politician who promised to end it. And the other guy goes, yeah, he's one of those tax and spend guys. He's one of those guys that taxes the poor so he can give breaks to the rich. And then he went off, and then he went off, and they're going at each other. And I just stepped back and said, oh. <laughs> Arguments like that aren't going to solve anything, are they? 
There's other times when it might be good to sit on the fence, and one of those might be when you're home. The wife comes in and says to you, husbands, hey, whose lasagna is better, mine or your mom's? <laughs> if I tell her hers and it gets back to mom, uh, if I tell her mom's, well, I might not have anything to eat tonight. <laughs> Honey, they're both good. How about when it comes time to decide what to watch on TV on a Sunday when you get home from church? What do you want to watch, hon? Wife says, well, she thinks to herself, the Hallmark Channel would be pretty nice. <laughs> but I know there's going to be this running commentary from him about how sappy the stories are and it's the same thing over and over. So instead she says, whatever you want, dear, knowing that he's going to turn on sports, He's going to turn on the Tigers, and there's still going to be a running commentary about how bad they are. Rebuilding since when, Ron? 1957? Yeah. Sometimes it is advisable to sit on the fence. I found this out early on between college rivalries, especially here in Michigan. When I worked at Hillers in West Bloomfield, there was about an equal amount of those that were fanatic about U of M and were fanatic about MSU. And just to try to be friendly, I would support one or say something nice about somebody wearing their U of M shirt, only to have somebody else come up and give me the riot act. Better just to be quiet. And then we were in the fellowship hall talking about how it is when people from Michigan drive into Ohio. The rivalry between Michigan and Ohio State is so strong that cars with Michigan plates on it have been vandalized. Best to stay on the fence when it comes to college rivalries. Now, a little warning for you. You want to have a discussion about which pastor is better? <laughs> Let me tell you, no matter which one you choose, you're going to get a talking to after worship is over. Just kidding. For many things in our life, it's good to sit on the fence. But there's one thing you cannot sit on the fence about, and that's the testimony that you live your life by. John makes it clear. There's only two options. There's the testimony of God, and there's the testimony of the world. One leads to life, and one leads to death, and there is no middle road. 1 John 5, verse 11. This is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life and that this life is in his Son. Now, I'm going to make a guess that most of you would agree wholeheartedly with this. You're Lutherans. You hear it preached day in and day out. You know that faith in Christ brings forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Now, what about those things and those issues that don't directly pertain to faith in Jesus, pertain to forgiveness of sins, and pertain to eternal life that culture might tell us, well, the Bible says this, but this is really the truth. And what I'm talking about was a discussion we had in Confirmation not too long ago Creationism versus evolution. When I was on vicarage, when I was at my home church before I went to seminary, most of the young people there went to Christian school, went to our Lutheran school or the Lutheran High Northwest. They seemed to have a good handle on creationism versus evolution. But encountering some of our kids who go to public school, that's not the case. I was unprepared for how hard they push evolution. After all, it's a theory. A theory that is unproven. You can't go in a lab and take non-life and make life happen. To support evolution, that's what has to happen. In a lab, you have inorganic material that becomes living. In a lab, you have a small little amoeba, and you can watch it evolve into a human being. 
That's not going to happen in a lab. Evolution is an unproven theory. And not the only theory. Creationism is also a theory. I can't take you back to the time of Genesis and prove to you that that's how it happened. We hold that by faith. But there's more answers in creationism than there is in evolution. And one of the amazing things that one of these kids brought was that the teacher had pointed to a whale, a whale that appeared to have a human pelvic bone, a pelvic bone that belonged in an animal, one that had hips and used to walk. And she claims this is proof for evolution because the whale used to be a land animal and it evolved and went into the sea and this pelvic bone is left over in the evolutionary process. Well, perhaps, or perhaps not. New studies have shown that this bone in whales has a use that has nothing to do with walking, has nothing to do with being left over in evolution. It's key for them to be able to procreate. Without this bone that looks like our pelvic bone, but is not actually functioning that way in a whale, they can have offspring. They can have babies. God designed the whale to have this bone so that it can continue to procreate. His design, not evolution. Well, there's that. Once again, if you believe in evolution, you can still believe in Jesus and technically you are saved, but I'll present another problem to you as far as testimony goes. What does Jesus testify to regarding the origins of human life? Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He who created them from the beginning, not started the evolutionary process, not a process that took six million years. On day six, the triune God created them male and female. Jesus saying this, if you're going to buy into evolution, it's got to make you wonder, wow, does Jesus have it wrong? Perhaps he should have been listening to our scientists today so he would know what's happening. Well, no, he was there at creation. He was a witness at creation. He knows exactly how men and women came to be, and it was not through evolution. It was creation. There is a voice that's out in culture that speaks against some of the principal beliefs of the church. That voice is the devil. And he uses things like this to turn your attention away from what Scripture says and away from what Jesus says and to create doubt. Just as he did with Eve in the garden, did God really say? Did God really say he created the world in six days? Did he really say that? Because once you question that, what else are you going to question from the mouth of Jesus? How about I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through me. If the devil can get you to question that, if your sinful heart can doubt that, what happens to your salvation? John says this, the testimony that God gave us, gave us is eternal life, and this life is in his son. You want to have life now and eternal life to come, the testimony that has to be upon your heart and in your mind is the son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. There's no sitting on the fence here. There's really no saying, well, evolution is okay and Jesus is okay. It's one or the other. You believe the world or you believe the testimony of God. And this is the testimony of God. Peter, before the Jewish council, testified to this. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you. Not a stone, 
but the stone that has become the cornerstone of the church. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. No other name. Not Allah, not Vishnu, not Buddha, not good works. Only in Jesus. The message from culture, the testimony from culture is definitely not that. You can have your Jesus. Just as one pathway to eternal life, one pathway to the Lord among many. But that's not what Scripture says. If you have Jesus, faith in him as Lord and Savior, you have eternal life. If you don't, well, you have eternal death. How about some other issues that the world tries to push on us? How about same-sex marriage and transgenderism? Jesus spoke on those. He verified that the account in Genesis 1 is God's word and what happened. God created man in his own image. He made them male and female. He blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Created them male and female for a reason. Now, if you're not male and female, if you're the same sex, you could conceivably maybe have dominion. But you can't procreate. That's God's basic building block design for the world. And it has not changed. Even though culture wants it to change, it has not changed. You can buy into culture. Say, that's okay. It's okay, you can make a decision to change your sex, to marry somebody of the same sex. But that's not what God's testimony says. And how long before the devil eats at you, you doubt this, and then you doubt what it says about Jesus being your Lord and Savior. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You give up your faith in God the Son. You give up your eternal life. In our reading, John talked about a sin that leads to death, which is an amazing thing because we know all sin is forgiven by God, do we not? Even the sins of transgenderism and same-sex marriage are forgiven when they're repented of. The sin that leads to death is unrepentant sin. It's leaving the testimony of God so far behind that you no longer believe in it, you no longer confess your wrongs according to it, you live out your life and what makes you happy and the world happy, and you die without faith. If the devil can move you, and believe me, he's trying to move you to doubt the testimony of God, if he can get you to doubt the testimony of Jesus, he'll keep poking and working on you until you give it up. And when you give it up, you cannot choose to return. That's what he wants. He doesn't care about same-sex marriage. He doesn't care about you being happy changing your sex. He knows he's heading to eternal hell, and he hates you, and he wants to take you with him. And he'll do it by whatever means, and he's still using the same thing he used in the garden, which is, did God really say Doubt in his testimony. Why should we believe the testimony of God over the testimony of the world? How much does the world love you? The world loves you as long as you're walking with it, as long as you're agreeing with it. You try to stand against it. You try to say some of the things I'm saying out in the public square, and you're going to find how much the world doesn't love you, how much it hates you. How about the testimony of God? It comes from a God who loved you so much that when you stood against him and opposed him, he gave what was most precious, his only son, to die for you. So that you could be forgiven. 
forgiven of all the ways that you doubt God's testimony, all the ways you stand against it, all the sins that you commit. With a repentant heart, all of those are forgiven. And where does that repentant heart come from? It's a gift from God through your baptism. The Holy Spirit who comes into you and never leaves you, who constantly points you to the testimony of the cross and the empty tomb and says, yes, you doubt my testimony. Yes, but you're forgiven. He brings the power of faith so that despite what the world says, and even when God's word says things that we don't understand and doesn't make sense, it's the power to hang fast to that because God said it. There's a lot of ways that the testimony of Scripture certainly triumphs in true logic and truth over what the world says. But there's some ways that might bring you to question. If they come from a God who loves you, who gave his son to die for you, and who comes to you now in the word and in the sacraments to point you away from that false truth and back to his truth and forgives you for all the ways you might doubt all the ways that you might veer away. You can't veer so far away that God cannot save you. Even those that have given up their faith, which I told you last week, I was one. God came into my life and brought me back. That's the God who loves us so very much. And that's the one whose testimony we hang fast to despite what the world says. Whoever believes in the Son of God has this testimony in himself, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that God's Scripture is absolute truth. When we don't believe what God's Scripture says, we make him out to be a liar because he says that this is truth. We align ourselves with the one who's the father of lies, the devil, who wants to draw you away from him but you have one that's stronger than him, the Holy Spirit who keeps turning you back. And he's working now through this message, through the sacraments, to point you back to what is truth. And the truth is Jesus. Jesus on the cross and risen from the dead to forgive you. There are times when it might be good, right, and proper to sit on the fence. There's a lot of arguments out in culture that, well, you're only going to cause animosity. There's things in the home where you're better not to say anything at all. But when it comes to how you live your life, what you base your life on, the truth of the world will gain you a lot of friends now, but it ends in death. The truth of Scripture which points to Christ. Christ dead on the cross for your sins and risen again for your justification. The faith the Holy Spirit places in your heart. That forgives all the times you veer away and want to follow the paths of the world and it brings you back to the one true faith that the Spirit engenders in your life now until the time that Christ returns. That's life now and it leads to eternal life to come. May that truth always be upon your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you are able. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This would be the time in our worship service. Whoa. It's a time in our worship service where we confess the Christian faith that we have, and we will do so through the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, Light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This would be the time in our worship service where we would pass the offering plate. Instead of that, I simply ask that you would drop your offerings off in the box on the way out in the narthex, the one across from the office during the week, that you would mail them in or use our online giving portal. Our offering verse for today comes from Acts chapter 1. All these were, one of co- um, all these were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Let us now sing thanks to the Lord for all the wonderful blessings that he has given us. may be seated for the prayers. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all in need of our prayers, that they may dwell in your house all their days of their lives and gaze upon your beauty manifested here in your word and sacrament, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church on earth, as she calls and chooses men to serve in the apostolic office, that God's word would continue to grow and bear fruit, and that these men, like Matthias, would be faithful to their calling, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For all who suffer persecution and have been forsaken by father, mother, and friend, that they be taken into the Lord's keeping and fear no foe, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For our president, governor, Congress, legislature, and judges, that the Lord would teach them the testimony of truth and make them wise and effective in their offices, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For all these who are sick and in distress, especially those on our prayer list, as well as these for whom special prayers have been requested. For Dallas, a friend of Barb Pike, hospitalized with COVID-19, that healing and restoration would be found through the Lord, let us pray to the Lord. For baby Zara, who's having hernia surgery, 
that that would be successful and she would have a complete recovery. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the family of Ron Gracie, uncle of Bonnie Petey, who passed away on Thursday, that the hope of the resurrection and faith in Christ would carry them through, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For Debbie Rush's brother, who's in the hospital with pancreatic cancer, that he would find hope and healing through faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For our brother, William Keel, who tripped and broke his hip on Thursday and has had replacement surgery, that his healing would be quick and he would get to return home, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For Mike Payne's mother, Karen, who needs help with healing on wounds from her leg, that the Lord would work complete healing and restoration. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For Mr. and Mrs. Shoebring's son-in-law, Steve, who has COVID, that through medicine and the doctors, the Lord would provide complete healing and recovery. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all these, that as they hold the Son of God in faithful hearts, they may also have eternal life and an answer for all their prayers. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all who celebrate anniversaries among us this past week, including Mikkel and Jane Wilson, Ricky and Gail Webster, and Bill and Elizabeth Kramer, that the love of Christ would draw them ever closer to each other and to their Savior in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Holy Father, accept the prayers we offer through your Son, our Savior, and keep us forever in your name and word, that we may be one, just as you are one. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. You who live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son, one God now and forever. Amen. I would invite you now to stand as you are able. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Hallelujah! The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Grant us your spirit, gracious Father, that we may give heed to the testament of your Son in true faith. And above all, firmly take to heart the words with which Christ gives us his body and blood for our forgiveness. By your grace, lead us to remember and give thanks for the boundless love which he has manifested to us when by pouring out his precious blood. He saved us from your righteous wrath and from sin, death, and hell. Grant that we may receive the bread and the wine that is his body and blood as a gift, guarantee, and pledge of his salvation. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, at his command and with his own words, we now receive his testimony. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Turn out his joy and his peace. Join all of your sin that has forgiven
May this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace. Amen. Rise as you are able now to sing to the Lord. thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Be the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace.
Alleluia! Christ is risen! He is risen indeed! Alleluia! The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. The love and peace of Christ Jesus, your Savior, has been poured out upon you richly and abundantly this day. In the same manner that it has been shared with you, pour out his gift upon those around you, to all who need to hear the gospel from your lips and by the work of your hands. In doing so, we serve the world as his church. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.